Stocks open weak on reports of tension escalating between Israel and Iran. The street stays on the edge with reality autos uh, taking a beating even as FMCG holds its ground. Infosys not only misses expectations on both revenues and margins but also paints a grim picture for FY25. The guidance of just 1-3% to growth which is far lower than what the analysts estimated. Bajaj Auto turns in a strong sales and profit performance beating expectations. Also guys for a better year riding on strong demand in the premium segment. India goes to polls as voting for the first phase of Lok Sabha polls for 102 seats across 21 states gets underway. In the largest of the seven phases, voting takes place across all 39 Lok Sabha seats in Tamil Nadu, which saw 24% voter turnout as of 11 a.m. Rajasthan has witnessed 23%, whereas Maharashtra has registered 20% voter turnout till 11 a.m. Good afternoon, you're watching us here on Halftime Report. I'm Bangla Malu and uh, joining me shortly is Ekta Batra. Looking very good for the markets, no problems so far. The reason why I say very good despite a 90-point downtick on the Nifty, a 500-point downtick on the Midcap Index and the Nifty Bank as well is the intraday chart. That will tell you. We opened a lot lower. There were worries and thereafter there were tensions which were dissipating but there still is some nervousness. We're out of danger perhaps for the market, not necessarily out of the woods and that's something which is good this afternoon about the markets. The street thought there could be a lot bigger cut in the indices as against what we're facing right now. The advanced decline ratio as well. The market opened with about 200 stocks in the green and that number has increased to about 700 this afternoon, notwithstanding the 1500 stocks which are still in the red. So let's talk about the tensions globally itself, the tensions which are escalating between Israel and Iran. An Iranian official told Reuters that there was no missile attack on Iran. Explosion was heard in Isfahan, which was a result of activation of Iran's air defense system. To discuss this and more, we have independent defense expert Maruf Raza and also Jonathan Shizil, Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Westminster Asset Management with us. Uh, first, we'll uh, ask Maruf, what exactly is currently underway? Where do you think... It goes from here, what the next step could be from either of the sides? See, the both, both sides are under pressure to show that they can deliver to the expectations of their people. And Israel is certainly not willing to take a moderate and a more balanced approach to everything because considering the fact that, yes, the attacks came to Israel from Gaza, and they've done sufficient damage there. I'm told thousands have been killed and pictures show that buildings have been completely demolished. But Mr. Netanyahu sees himself as a war prime minister. And Mr. Netanyahu sees this as, as a kind of revival of his political fortunes because he was in the dumps as far as the Israeli political situation went just before the attack took place on, from Gaza. Now, as far as the missile thing is concerned, you know, in military terms, we call it, uh, you know, checking the response mechanism of the other side. Uh, these could be fake attacks. These could be fake uh, movement into Israel's, uh, Iran's airspace. So those things being what they are, uh, I don't think Mr. Netanyahu is going to go the whole hog now because there's too much pressure on him internationally. And if he does, then he has to be held responsible for the complete economic mayhem that will come about in the Gulf region because Iran is not going to stop short of blocking the Hormuz Strait. Iran is not going to stop short of attacking various vulnerable points in Israel. Israel has just shown that despite it's much uh, trumpeted security infrastructure. It was very vulnerable to a Hezbollah attack. So there are issues that we need to understand. Everyone's going to be pushing. Right. There's going to be a war lobby that will push for conflict situations because they can sell arms. There's going to be an oil lobby that will push for tensions because the premium on a tense situation on oil hmm. will go up by 20-30%. 
and there will be a lobby of countries making roundabout statements about talking about peace and negotiations. But about time they get onto the table or they get onto the battlefield. All right, uh, table or battlefield, there are so many lobbies. Let's, let's uh, you know, speak about whether we can afford a war right now or not uh, in just a bit. But until then, let's speak about the investment lobby. Jonathan, you know, the street was just about coming to terms with uh, normalization in, uh, you know, uh, the West Asian region. And things have flared up once again. Everyone was focusing on all the other macros, which included the likes of economic recovery, maybe at some point reducing uh, interest rates towards the end of this year, if not three, at least two, uh, if not two, at least one. And then talking about all the elections, etc. What does the investment lobby do in a situation like this? <laughs> Well, I think, as, as you've uh, pointed out earlier, one thing it isn't doing it just at the moment is panicking. Um, yeah, the early moves in the markets were a sort of initial reaction to the news of what was happening. But clearly, some sort of calm work, a little bit of calmness has been restored. And India in particular is, is, is obviously um, performing relatively well to other markets. I think, um, you know, to put it simply, the, from an investment perspective, um, the, the one factor, if you like, that, in, that, it, that investors don't like is uncertainty. And clearly, we still have dollops of uncertainty um, ahead. Nobody quite knows uh, what is going on. Um, and clearly, we, you know, it is it's very difficult to predict um, what, you know, where this will lead to and what will happen. So I think uncertainty coupled with rising oil prices, coupled with inflation that's not shifting down, the market was already in a mood to um, sell off a little bit after a very strong quarter. So probably um, the geopolitical tensions are just adding to an already slightly jittery sense that we had already. So what would your call then on the market be? And you said that markets don't like uncertainty. You said there's still been some calm. Is this a calm before the storm or is it a calm of recovery that, OK, maybe things may not escalate as much? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, you know, I think the interesting uh, market to look at will be some of the government bond markets. Usually in times where you see extreme geopolitical tensions, investors head straight for the government bond markets for the perceived safety of government bonds. We saw a little bit of a, a movement, say, in the U US 10-year yields earlier on um, this morning, but that's already calmed down as well. So, you know, we haven't really considering what is going on in the Middle East, seen any tick up um, in government bond yields. They've all been heading higher, which is, as you discussed previously, more down to rising inflation and the clouded outlook for interest rates. So we haven't really seen a, a big move in the markets just yet, but obviously this, that, that could happen if the situation continues to escalate. Hmm. Uh, Maruf, just wanted your thoughts that if in case there is an escalation that does take place between Israel and Iran, do you think that it would be long drawn, something that we've seen with Russia, Ukraine, and now we're probably seeing the same thing take place with Israel and Gaza? Question, but the point is that, you know, when you fight low intensity battles like Israel is fighting in Gaza, those can go on forever. I had said from day one that it's going to be a long drawn out battle for attrition of attrition in Gaza, and Israel's not going to have a cakewalk, whatever its high tech armory Israel may boast of. As far as Ukraine is concerned, I think Mr. Putin's team is completely clueless about what their aim is. And I had said at the start of the <coughs> Ukraine invasion, that Mr. Putin would do well to take parts of eastern Ukraine and then call for a truce and then go and negotiate with a position of strength. Here, there are two possibilities. One is it could be a short, sharp shootout, tit for tat kind of thing. You hit me, I hit you, and I've shown that you know I'm not going to take it lying down. Or if Iran responds, and which it probably will, with everything it has, and in Iran is not exactly militarily a pushover, then the situation could escalate to other countries in the Gulf region, and more importantly, hit the oil markets 
because if it's unstable there then obviously we all know that the prices of oil go up from 90 dollars a barrel to 120 130 and the oil investors uh, make a killing with it but long and short of it is it is not going to give israel any conclusive results except for mr betanyahu who will probably be thumping his chest and saying you hit me i hit you back but can he count for the 3000 lives that he took in gaza can he count for the lives that this future conflict will cost as far as india is concerned india is going to wait and watch because india has got ties with both israel and iran but i personally believe that with china and russia backing iran and the united states they making promises but not having the guts to actually twist mr netanyahu's arm to say okay calm down the situation is going to linger on for many months okay johnson now well let's uh, wrap up this conversation with your position on other asset classes outside of equities given this uncertain environment for example we have metals which are rising as well and on the other hand we have gold which is at a record high uh, do you have a lot of uh, investors asking you about allocating money to different asset classes if so what are you recommending absolutely um yeah look i, I think uh Clearly, we're in a phase and, um, you know, obviously, if oil prices do move higher, inflation clearly is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue that's certainly coming back to haunt some of the major markets. And therefore, you know, from our perspective, we think um, oil stocks or oil um, is, is probably the best inflation and geopolitical hedge you've got at the moment. So we are quite invested in that part of the market. We do have and have had for some time good positions in gold as well, and that's obviously been um, an interesting area to be more recently. But you're quite right. Um, obviously, the data that had been coming out um, was showing, you know, very strong or reasonably strong global growth. Uh, better, better data coming out of out of the U.S. Obviously, China slowly recovering, and therefore the commodity markets do look very interesting. We have some uh, good exposure to. The broader commodity complex as well, um, and I th and I just probably finally finish on the fact that if we do see um, um, yields in bond markets coming off a little bit, that's probably a good time to sell because we're quite bearish on uh, on the bond prices as well. Just to follow up to that, uh, Jonathan. Before we let you all go, crypto. Where does that uh, fall in the scheme of things? Because now. There'll be people saying that, okay, let the governments go to war, let, let bond yields rise, let's uh, focus on an asset class which has nothing to do with the government. Uh, do you think that makes a case? Well, I think it's been very interesting, hasn't it? With, with I mean, crypto is the ultimate momentum trade, um, but you've seen crypto coming off as geopolitical tensions have, have risen, and there were plenty out there who were saying it's the new gold. So I don't know, it's, it's not particularly behaving um, as an anti-fragile asset as such at the moment. Now, obviously, there's you know, complications with the halving of the Bitcoin and all this other stuff going on at the moment. But ultimately, to us, it's not an asset class we look at. Um, it seems to be more of a m momentum trade than anything else. And clearly, at the moment, it's suffering a little bit um, from that momentum. All right, gentlemen. Now, uh, well, we're going to leave it on that note. I'm sure it's a conversation we'll probably uh, revisit soon enough. But thank you very much for joining it, Maroof, as well as Jonathan, this morning. Well, we need to take a short break. Um, but up next, we're going to put the focus on the market's unabated surge during Prime Minister Modi's second term. We'll get you an exclusive report on the market trajectory in the last five years. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Seems like the recovery has now got some more legs. When we started the show, the Nifty was down 90 points. Now the Nifty is down just around 46, 56 points, which implies that the recovery has been almost 150 points from today's low of around 21,777. The Nifty sitting with a cut of around 56 points, but a lot better than what it was in the morning itself. And it also marks an important day for India's democracy where, you know, we start the first phase of polling for the, uh, you know, uh, for 
electing the government, what has happened in the last term of the Modi government is something that we're looking back at today as well as the street looks at Modi 3.0 at some point. 90% gains coming in for the Nifty. Eventful five years, Holmes. Eventful five years indeed. And as you were mentioning, right, that the term for the Modi government and even more eventful five years have been for the market. Now, it has overcome one headwind after another to get to where it stands today. And no one can forget the COVID-19 pandemic and the lows of 75-11 that the Nifty had made. Just a few weeks earlier, we stood here celebrating the Nifty tripling from those levels. The pandemic, though, was not the only headwind that the market had to go through. The Russia-Ukraine war, the rising oil prices, the Fed uncertainties, which continue till date and yet and the market has remained resilient for most parts of it. Now it has witnessed the mega LIC IPO, the Adani Hindenburg scandal, the arrival of GQG which has now become the biggest foreign investor into India's equity markets, the mega PSU rally of the last 12 months, the trend of foreign promoters cashing in. The market has seen so much over the last five years. Now amidst all of this, the Nifty, the Sensex, the broader markets, all of them made new highs this month. In fact, the Sensex even crossed the 70 5,000 mark and market participants are expecting levels of a lack on the index sooner than later. Let's now get to the numbers and the Nifty has nearly doubled in the last five years. Mind you, we are comparing returns from the 23rd of May 2019, which was when the BJP and Prime Minister Narendra Modi had won that historic second term in office. The broader markets have done well, though the mid-cap index has nearly tripled, while the small-cap index is also up two and a half times. Now, barring FMCG, almost all the indices have gained at least 100% over the last five years. The Realty Index has emerged as the best performer, gaining nearly 248% during this period. But now coming to the Nifty in specific, and no index heavyweight features among the top performers on the Nifty since May of 2019. The names though are not entirely unsurprising either. Adani Enterprises features as the top gainer here, followed by Tata Motors, Apollo Hospitals and Bharti Airtel also makes an appearance here. And only one Nifty constituent in the last five years has delivered negative returns and that is Indusind Bank which is down 8% percent during this period. The underperformers though are the usual suspects, HUL, HDFC Bank and other major private banks like Axis and Kotak. Now when we go sector wise first we look at autos and Tata Motors DVR 654% in the last five years but Balkrishna Industries is the one name that stands out here that has tripled in value since May of 2019. Metals continue to remain in focus and Hindustan Copper is up almost 7x in the last five years and although Vedanta and Hindustan and Zinc are recent outperformers. They are the worst performers on the metals index over a five-year time span. Now, IT may be under pressure recently, but over the last five years, mid-cap IT has very easily outperformed their large-cap peers. Take a look at this. Persistent Systems up over 1100%. Coforge is up 4x and LTT has, has tripled. Now, although Infosys and TCS have doubled or nearly doubled in value over the last five years, they could not match up to their mid-cap peers. On to Pharma and that was was a big outperformer during COVID but has seen some reversion to mean since then. Loras Lab saw most of its surge coming in during the COVID phase and is currently struggling a bit but among the underperformers includes the likes of Gland Pharma and Biocon, stocks that have barely moved during Modi 2.0. As we highlighted, real estate was the best sector and here too, most of the stocks have at least doubled in value. However, Suntech Realty is an outperform, underperformer and is down 10% and it sticks out like a sore thumb in this list of otherwise outperformers. FMCG struggled and is possibly the only index that does not have triple digit returns in the last five years. But specific stocks like Varun Beverages have been winners all along, up over 900% during this period, as is Radico Khetan and Tata Consumer. But ITC, despite the outperformance, performance that we saw in 2022 and 23 features on the list of underperformers here as does HUL that has just not moved. The flavor over the last 12 months though have been PSUs and like a look at this IRCTC and HAL both up over a thousand percent during these last five years while BEL is up over 500 percent. The underperformers here
year featured the likes of OMCs, the oil marketing companies and ONGC. The broader markets did well. The mid-cap index has nearly tripled with seven stocks seeing returns of over a thousand percent. And take a look at this fact, Dixon Technologies, Masgaon Dog that listed in 2020 is up 1400 percent. So there are some outperformers here, but there are wealth creators and there are wealth destroyers as well. Take a look at this, Paytm, Yes Bank, Bandhan Bank, Z Entertainment, UPL, the recent Nifty exclusion, that also features in the list of underperformers. The small caps underperformed the mid cap peers, but also surged two and a half times during Modi 2.0. Tata Tele, Tanla Platforms, JBM, Auto, Titagad are some of the top performers here. And the underperformers features only four names, the likes of RBL Bank, City Union, the Demerged, Piramal Pharma, and PVR Inox features in this list. So it's been a roller coaster for the markets in these last five years. The country has gone to polls today and the markets are looking to rebound from this recent sell-off. After all, the market also needs a vote of confidence just like this government. Indeed it does and uh, the vote of confidence for this market is actually coming from retail investors who at the start of the Modi 2.0 were just about 3.5 crore DMAT accounts which has sur surged all the way up to 14 crore DMAT accounts. SIP is increasing from roughly 3,000 crores per month to over 20,000 crores per month as well. Thanks a lot Hormaz for putting that uh, up for us and the Nifty Bank as we speak has moved into the green. So that's the headline at the moment. The Nifty Bank has recovered about 500 points from the lows and if we Stay on just for a little more. Chances are that we see the Nifty go back into the green as well, which is sitting with a cut of just about 16 odd points. So the Nifty Bank recovery has been led largely by HDFC Bank, which was resilient all through today's trading session and now has moved to the high point of trade with a gain of almost 1%, a recovery of 2% from the lows, giving it company on the, you know, the way up is ICICI Bank, which too has moved into the green after staying in the red for most part of today's trading session. So recovery that we've seen for ICICI Bank at the high point of trade. So both these private banking names supporting the Nifty Bank, which in turn is supporting the Nifty. And outside support for the Nifty, apart from Nifty Bank, is coming in from names like Bajaj Finance, which has moved to the high point of trade, Tata Consumer, which is doing well, and Maruti Suzuki too has moved into the green after a 2.5% recovery from the lows. So those are a bunch of stocks that are doing well. Don't go anywhere. Take a short break, come back and by then hopefully the Nifty would be in the green and we'll get Manish Hathi Ramani of Deen Dayal Investments to join in with some trading strategies. Stay tuned. The Nifty all but in the green right now, sitting with a cut of just about four points. The Sensex, as we speak, has moved into the green. So that's the head, another headline for uh, the afternoon. The Sensex actually should come up for you. That's moved into the green. So most of it, uh, you know, recovered from the lows. And the Nifty sitting with a cut of just about five points. Uh, the Nifty Bank now comfortably in the green with a 70-point uptick. And the Mid-Cap Index too has curtailed its losses from about a percent just 15 minutes ago to two-thirds of a percent. And uh, the Nifty as well, just about moving into the green. So just stay on with the Nifty intraday chart and you'd realize that it may shortly go into the green. It's sitting with a cut of just about two, three points. So, you know, as we speak, the market has seen recovery from the lows. We've seen the advance decline ratio as well move uh, more in favor of advances as the day progressed. We started with about 200 stocks in the green and that's uh, quadruple to around 400 stocks. Let's see if at some point these lines converge and we see more stocks advancing. Uh, usually the mid cap index moves faster than the frontline indices. So if there is any semblance of recovery, we'd probably see the mid cap index move faster as well with a cut of about three quarters of a percent right now. And uh, we'll see how it goes. For today, the low of today has been extremely crucial for the Nifty. It's uh, 21,778, which coincides with the 100 day moving average for the Nifty Bank as well. It broke below the 100 day moving average and the 50 day moving average and has conquered both of them right up away. The 20 day moving average, an important mark on the way up for both these indices. The situation, however, is still tense. We're not out of the woods, which is reflected in the kind of up move that we're seeing in the India VIX as well, still holding about the 13.5, 13.75 sort of zone. Um, important to see if the Nifty goes past that 22,000 mark and sustains out there or not. Because 
On the way down, 21,800 seems an important support. The put writers are active there. But at the same time, call writers are equally active on the 22,000 level as well. A bunch of stocks we're watching out for. A lot of short positions added on both Bajaj Auto as well as Tata.com. Biocon may enter FNO ban today. And I'm looking at Nalco and GNFC. They've been in the FNO ban for a while. They may exit today, given the open interest action that's taking place there. Okay, all right, uh, Manglab, thanks very much for that. Well, let's uh, see 22 points lower now for the Nifty. So maybe some amount of selling at the top, which is taking place. But uh, all things said, it has been a strong intraday recovery that we've seen for the market. So uh, the Bank Nifty in the green, up around 30 odd points. Manish Hathi Ramani joins in to discuss the technicals of the market this afternoon. Manish, hi, welcome to the show. Well, uh, it's a smart recovery that we've seen. Mid caps are still lagging, but nonetheless, how would you approach the frontliners? Good afternoon to you and to all our viewers. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Well, I'm of the opinion that Nifty has a very strong support at 21,710, to be specific, because that was a low which was made around the 20th of March of this year. As long as we can bounce from those levels or close to those levels, I don't see a major breakdown. Having said that, if we were to break that level of 21,700 round figure, we can fall another 300 to 350 points. While we are seeing this kind of an up move or this kind of a bounce right now, I would not find it very heartening unless we are not able to close in the green for at least a couple of days. Until then, I will be very cautious and very skeptical on the long side, and I would continue recommending trades on the short side. Right. So you've said that, uh, you know, if it breaks 21,700, there is a downtick of almost 300 points from there. So from current levels, it would be about a 500-point downtick if one were to short here. But you typically play for, uh, you know, bigger moves on either side. Were we to, you know, see a recovery and if the Nifty closed in the green today, how big could the up move be? Are you looking at all-time highs once again, anytime in the near future? It won't happen so soon. What my suggestion would be, I would probably keep a ballpark of approximately 22,300. 22, Only when we're able to get past that level of 22,300 will I feel that now the shorts are over, supports have been respected, and thereafter for certain I can say we should be heading back to 22,600 and 22,800. Views on the stocks? From the stocks, I would still be recommending shops. From the frontliners, I'm looking at TCS and Dr. Reddy. TCS is a sell for a target of 3,700, stop loss of 3880. There has been a large volume breakdown around the 3,900 levels. Also, the stock, stock has recently triggered the intermediate lows of 3829, which was made on 27th March. The second sell is on Dr. Reddy for a target of 5850, stop loss 6130. 6050 to 6150, that 100 point range was a major support block, which has broken down on the back of very high volumes. Since the stock has also broken a couple of higher time frame supports, the fall can extend to 5500 if 5050 does not hold. Okay, all right, Manisha, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and giving us uh, all of those strategies and as well as stock picks. Just watch out for ONGC because that seems to be going home with the maximum gains this week. That stock is up around 4 odd percent on a week-to-date basis. And Telecom has done well. Bharti Airtel is seeing follow-on buying today marginally. But nonetheless, the stock is probably going to go home with gains of over 3 odd percent week-to-date. We'll take a short break. But up next, we'll be talking uh, to Karan Bhagat, founder, MD and CEO at 361, to discuss opportunities and key trends in the real estate investment trust space. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, you're still tuned into Halftime Report on CNBC TV 18. Let's get you an exclusive conversation now with B. Tyag Rajan, MD Blue Star, who is talking with our colleague Danish Anand. Say, and he says that uh, with the predictions of a harsh summer, the dealers have stocked up well and uh, they look forward to a build up this summer in terms of sales. Listen in to what he had to say. Close to around 40% of our annual profits come during this season. Last year was a bad summer. It rained a lot. 
and uh, this time around uh, the predictions are it will be a harsh summer and uh, the indication so far has been it, it, it is indeed so. So the dealers have stocked up very well and to build up to the summer, March itself was a very huge uh, month for the industry and booster and the demand is uh, holding. So now uh, coming to the, the commercial refrigeration space, uh, what is the market share that you're chasing right now and going down in the, going down a few years down the line, what is the target that you have set? Market share has never been an issue for this business for Blue Star because we have been pioneers, we have been there for uh, more than six, seven decades. That's not the issue. The question is that when India uh, will start consuming uh, commercial refrigeration and when the integrated cold chain infrastructure will fully develop. It has been growing well, it has taken off uh, and I think in the coming years it will grow further. To give you, a, give you a picture, it is the market size is between uh, rupees 4,500 crore to 5,000 crore. Uh, we think uh, somewhere in FI28 it will cross 10,000 crores. That is the rate at which it is growing. We have been, uh, we have been uh, maintaining around 35% market share and uh, we look forward to uh, improving it further. So what are your CAPEX plans for the new financial year and uh, can we expect the company to expand its manufacturing capability? We have done significant uh, investments in the past couple of years. So there will be additional investment in air conditioning because uh, that CCT plant is a modular expansion, uh, 3 lakh per, unit, per year. So in FI23 it was 3 lakh. FI 20, uh, sorry, FI24, it was 3 lakh, FI25, it will become 6, FI26, it will become 9, so on and so forth. It goes up to 1.2 million. So that calls for an investment. In deep freezers, last year we invested for the less than 300 liter capacity deep freezers as a part of localization uh, initiative. And uh, in FI27, Deep freezer will require a new investment, which uh, which may be in northern India. We don't know yet. We have to plan for that. Great. So it has also been predicted that the monsoons this time uh, will be much better in comparison to what we have seen in the last few years. So as far as the monsoon is concerned and how as far as it is correlated to the rural sales, do you expect the rural sales to outperform the urban sales? Very clearly, festival season sales always is dependent on how the monsoon has, because if 65% sale is coming from tier 3, 4, 5, in India, monsoon is a very important factor. That's what drives the consumption there. So for our company, summer is important, monsoon is important, even winter is important. For, for the simple reason, we do have certain products which are meant for heating as well in some parts. Okay, all right. On that note, we need to take a short break. But up next, we'll get you that conversation with 361 to discuss opportunities and key trends in the real estate investment trust space. Hello and welcome to the show, uh, to the special offering REIT Connect where we explain to you all the tenets and aspects of real estate investment trusts and how it can be part of your diversified investment portfolio. And let me welcome on the show Karan Bhagat. Uh, he is the MD and CEO of 361. Karan, always a pleasure to welcome you on CNBC TV 18. Now my first question to you. REITs are a newer asset class. How do you see its potential and how do you feature this in a diversified portfolio? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you, Nisha, for having me on CNBC TV 18. Um, I think REITs are a very interesting asset class and especially uh, from a portfolio allocation perspective, given the change in debt taxation in the last budget, REITs have become specially attractive. All fixed income mutual funds are now taxed at marginal tax rates. REITs, however, continue to have a preferred, slightly preferred tax because the tax is already played in the special purpose vehicle before getting distributed to the clients. So if you compare it to the 10-year GSEC, today our REITs are giving us around about 5 to 5.8 to 5.9% on a post-tax basis. 
Uh, so for a client, effectively, he's getting four things. One, he's getting 5.8, 5.9% on a post-tax basis. Second, he's able to allocate and take advantage of the capital appreciation on in commercial real estate over the next 10 to 15 years. Thirdly, he's able to uh, take advantage of the fact of increase in rental over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And lastly, he's also able to take benefit of the fact that these are multiple set of properties lulled into one. And as occupancy increases from the current yields of 80 to 83% to 100%, that benefit would also flow into the REIT. So overall, I think the 5.8 to 6% can move towards the 9 to 10%. So it's nowhere close to an equity alternative. Uh, for It definitely does not substitute equity in a client's portfolio, but it's a very, very interesting part of his fixed income portfolio, which can potentially end up giving 8 to 10% post-tax over the next three to five years. It's interesting you said, Karan, that it's uh, not as good as equity or uh, not at par with equity and more considered as a fixed product. Uh, but I would say that internationally, globally, where it's a much larger asset class, it is classified as an equity product, uh, barring the uh, dividend distribution, which is mandatory on the companies. But Karan, uh, if you really uh, compare this with investment in other property asset classes, like a real estate company stock or else a property investment. How do you rate REIT vis-a-vis uh, -vis them? So I, I, maybe Nisha, I'll correct myself a little bit. I, I, I don't think it can be compared to equity. So I think the risk reward is really very, very different uh, because a REIT by definition has a has a yield distribution of approximately on pre-tax seven quarter, seven half. Obviously, mm -hmm. when you buy a stock, you're subject to slightly much more volatility and you're seeking higher returns from a growth perspective. So from a REIT mm -hmm. perspective, I wouldn't consider, I wouldn't compare it to stocks. Uh, but overall, I think uh, both have their place in the portfolio. I think most mm -hmm. of our large high net worth clients today would have 50 to 60% of their portfolio in stocks and still would have around about 30 to 40% of the portfolio on the fixed income side. Within the yeah. fixed income side of 30 to 40%, I think REITs offers a serious alternative to be around 15, 20% of that 40%. So effectively for most clients today, uh, REITs would, would make up close to five to 10% of their portfolio. Uh, we only have uh, four listed REITs in the country, but as the yeah. sector becomes deeper and wider, I think this allocation yes. will move from 5% to, towards 10 odd percent. Right, so how do you see the potential going forward, Karan, for this particular asset class? You said it's only 5 to 10%, and obviously it is only in the commercial real estate segment. We haven't even touched on the residential side and other subsets of real estate, which are really growing in a meaningful way. So how do you see the potential going forward in this? And um, your company also has a license for REIT. What are your plans for that, given the potential outlook that you have? So I think overall, uh, the potential for REITs as a broad asset class continues to be fairly large. I think yeah. globally, apart from apart from having uh, uh, REITs on the commercial side, even uh, housing, real estate, uh, residential housing REITs are very, very popular and extremely large. Apart from that, you've got co-living REITs, you've got hostel REITs, and so on and so forth. I think generally speaking in India, residential uh, real estate prices have always been uh, slightly on the higher side for the right set of reasons. And therefore, the yields on the residential uh, uh, apartments continue to be stared lower at 4 to 5% as compared to commercial at 7 to 8%. Uh, so I think once, once kind of uh, there is a little bit of more stability in the rental yields, on the residential side, you'll see some of them converting into uh, converting into REITs. Uh, I think it's not it's not a question of uh, uh, if it's a question of when. So eventually, it will happen. Whether it happens over the next 12 to 18 months or the next 24 to 36 months is something which time will tell. But overall, I think uh, uh, REITs will grow across all of these spaces, whether it's senior living, hostel living, co-living, uh, commercial REITs, or uh, even residential REITs. Commercial REITs, obviously, the easiest to understand. And now we've got also a mall REIT, which is listed, which is Nexus. So I think across these six broad strategies, uh, you'll mm -hmm. see enough, uh, enough, enough uh, increase in the depth and the width of the market over the next three to five years. On our own side, I think uh, we've got our own uh, REIT license, which uh, we have approximately 12 to 15 months to still uh, to still decide whether we launch our own REIT or not. So we're still firming up plans there, early days. Uh, but but over the next three to six months, we like the space. And uh, if we find ourselves having a sweet spot or a unique opportunity to develop our own REIT, we will definitely look at it. 
right and in terms of uh, the suggestions how this can become a more attractive asset class what would you say because on the tax side it is attractive but more can be done there even equity classification is what the industry is lobbying for any suggestions that you have no, i think i think overall tax has come out well i i, I think the, the both both the both the uh, both the regulator the ministry as well as the tax department have done a good job i think it's got a pass through so the tax is rightfully paid in the special purpose vehicle and at the uh, at the recipient's level it is exempted from tax so honestly i think uh, from a tax perspective a lot has been done obviously more can be done but a lot has been done so i'm quite uh, comfortable there i think uh, one pending uh, pending demand was really the secs uh, uh, regulation being modified, which too has kind of come in some format or the other over the last two and a half, three months. So I think the utilization of uh, the REITs uh, definitely will move up from the current 82-83% closer to the 90-95%, which which will also affect the which will also help the help the REITs. And uh, I think finally, uh, you know, uh, maybe both classification as equity as and also more importantly, I think. Uh, the REITs trade in uh, larger lot sizes. If they can be traded in smaller lot sizes, especially the larger ones, I think it will allow a greater pool of people to access the uh, uh, access the REIT. All right, so great suggestions there, Karan. But a quick question before I let you go. Uh, what's your view on the market in the near term? Some of the big, big events happening in election season, interest rate cut, uh, expected geopolitics. How do you see all this really impacting our markets in the near term? So I think uh, we, we can't escape from the fact that the markets are slightly uh, uh, expensive on the valuation side. I think uh, if you look at price to book uh, historical multiples for the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we are closer to the, towards the three and a half to 3.7 times as compared to the long term average of closer to the three to 3.2 times. So we are definitely a standard standard one, one and a half standard deviation away from the, uh, from the long term averages. Having said that, I think uh, generally speaking, uh, if I look at the large cap and the large mid cap space, which broadly would include the top maybe 300 to 400 stocks, as well as some uh, mid-cap stocks which have large institutional ownership. I think these two categories um, uh, may correct a bit, but they definitely is, are not going to correct in a such a meaningful way that you have an opportunity to get out of equities and get in again. Uh, I think uh, the, I think broadly, FI investors across the world over the last 24 months have under-allocated to, uh, to, to India. And especially these two segments, if the market's correct, will uh, get a huge amount of investor appetite uh, from these yeah. set of investors. So for these set of stocks, I wouldn't really worry. I would I would stay invested. There will be a little bit of volatility, a little bit of shocks. Uh, which event will cause it? Uh, we really don't know. But I think I would I would kind of hang in there. Uh, on mm -hmm. the on the on the mid cap side and the small cap side, I think there are you know again it's very stock specific, but there are excesses there, and that's mm -hmm. where I would be a little a little bit uh, wary. And if there's a deep correction in the market, some of those stocks could potentially correct 15 to 40 percent. And therefore, you know we, we need to be very very careful on. Uh, which mid cap and uh, small mid cap and small cap stocks we own. But outside of that, uh, from a five year perspective, right. the markets continue to look constructive. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karan Bhagat, for joining us right here on Read Connect. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that, it's time for a short breather on the show. Welcome back and joining us on the show now is Vandana Hari. She's founder and CEO at Vanda Insights. Vandana, hi, good to have you. And it was some morning with so many statements coming in from various agencies and then, of course, the country, spokespersons, etc. And we've seen some settling in case of crude prices happen right now. Uh, what do you make of what happened in the morning? And would you say that the nerves are really frayed? Because whatever we hear, there is a sentiment impact. Uh, that's it, Manisha. I think you've summed up everything. You've left very little for me to say. <laughs> Indeed, uh, what a morning, uh, a major jolt through the crude markets and we saw Brent at one point was um, more than 4% higher than mm. uh, Thursday's settlement. And, um, you know, that was a very natural, it was a knee-jerk reaction from the market, but a very natural reaction in the current circumstances because, uh, look, um, the tensions between Israel and Iran are the highest possibly that any one of us have seen in our lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as much as both the sides have been say uh, been saying they do not want to, to escalate the situation further, uh, there's also been quite a bit of rhetoric being exchanged uh, from both the sides. So it's entirely believable when you see news reports, headlines, confirmed or not, saying that there have been explosions in Iran, 
some explosions heard in Syria and Iraq. Um, and, uh, you know, it's easy to believe that these are missiles being fired from Israel. But, you know, uh, fast forward a few hours and um, it things have calmed down considerably. So we at one point Brent was touching $91 this morning. Now it's around $88 a barrel. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, uh, some more details have emerged beyond the first few headlines, uh, which suggest that either if it was indeed an Israeli attack, then again, it was, I would say, without comparing it completely to what Iran did last week, uh, last weekend, but perhaps mm -hmm. again, symbolic, you know, designed to show us, uh, a, a, a retaliation, but not cause damage. And, uh, you know, Iranian media and Iranian leaders have been doing their bit to you know, calm everything down and say that, you know, no danger has been done. It's like business as usual, you know, go about your daily lives. So um, mm. where that leaves oil is really, I mean, on tenterhooks, Manisha, jittery, nervous. Uh, I don't think this sort of volatility, fragility uh, is going to end anytime soon. Mm. But Vandana, would you say that we've seen uh, a lot of maturity, even responsibility when you, uh, you know, responsive nature when it comes to Iran and Israel in some way and absolutely for the crude traders here because we did see that premium build up, but that's come off and we didn't see markets break down in some sense. Yeah, it's that's an interesting point, Manisha. Is it uh, just crisis fatigue uh, happening in the oil markets mm. or... As you say, I'd like to believe that perhaps the oil market has finally, or participants have become more mature, um, more doing more considered assessment. So you mm. will still get the kind of knee-jerk reactions that we saw this morning, right? I think that's sure. inevitable. But the fact that crude, and this is being increasingly talked about even outside the oil markets, that oil is not, it doesn't go into panic mode as such, you know, because... Mm. Panic mode would have meant you hear a headline about a missile fly, fly, flying anywhere in the Middle East and crude starts racing towards 100. So, you know, $5, mm. $10 up and down. But that's not happening. And I suppose in some ways, Manisha, this is a, a relief factor, isn't it? It is, sure. But on the other side, well, of course, uh, geopolitics is something that we will continue to look at, Vandana. But we also have seen sanctions coming on Venezuela and Iran. Uh, would you say the market, markets have priced that in? So th there's nothing to price in, uh, Manisha. There's uh, both those sanctions, and I've looked closely at the wordings uh, from the U.S. Treasury, the um, Office of Foreign Assets, Assets Control, uh, uh, by the in the U.S., and they have been very, very careful. First of all, uh, what is relevant to Venezuelan production, most relevant to the increase in Venezuelan production that we've seen of about hundred thousand barrels per day, uh, is Chevron's presence there. That is not being affected. So we need to be very clear about that. Chevron Chevron is in that country producing in a joint venture with uh, Pedavesa under a completely different license that remains unaffected. Chevron will okay. uh, continue buying, uh, cr taking uh, Venezuelan crude back into the U.S. That's also very important for the American refiners. Iran, um, the U.S. has been very, very careful to not touch the energy sector, not just oil, but energy sector of Iran. The, the latest uh, round of sa sanctions announced yesterday are very specifically targeted towards the Revolutionary Guard um, and the Iranian Defense Ministry and basically technology that allows uh, Iran to produce missiles and drones, the kinds that they use to attack uh, Israel last Saturday. So um, mm. again, I do not expect Iranian uh, production or exports to be affected at all. Okay. Having said that, and with the kind of scenario that we are living in right now, where data and China and interest rate cuts are conversation, and of course, geopolitics, there's just so much to watch out and there's as much a trader can do and mm. a difficult one. But where do you see the crude prices moving from here on? Is there a range that you're looking at in the first half, second half, quarter to quarter? How are you working with it? So I think uh, the geopolitical uh, premium in crude right now, I would say if you look at $90 Brent, it's easily $12 to $15 a barrel. I really don't see that receding much. So what we have seen over the past fortnight or so uh, amidst heightened tensions between uh, Iran and Israel has been, you know, plus minus three, four dollar range. Uh, a substantial pullback uh, will really need 
um, some sort of a ceasefire agreement, some, some temporary rapprochement in Gaza and then followed by a more uh, enduring um, you know, peace deal over there. And I don't know how many months or even years that's going to take. So that premium remains intact. The, there's a bit of premium on account of the um, heightened warfare between uh, Ukraine and Russia as well. So we've seen Ukrainian drone strikes against Russian refineries uh, take close to 800,000 barrels per day of Russian refining capacity, put it out of commission temporarily. So that remains in place. Um, so, you know, whether crude uh, Brent next settles closer to in the 75 to 80 band or remains closer to 85 to 90, I think it's all a function of what happens to these two wars. Okay, well, definitely a lot of moving parts, Vandana, as well as Manisha. Thank you very much for joining in and taking us through that conversation. Uh, well, on that note, we need to wrap up with the news that the Nifty is now in the green, so up around 44-odd points, and we have the Sensex, which is up around 200-odd points. So it's a complete reversal in terms of an intraday sentiment that we've seen from the time we started trade or even the news headlines pre-market to where we are now. Mid-cap index still underperforming, but it seems as though it's probably on its way to see a further intraday recovery in line with what we are seeing for the frontline indices. It's a wrap on Halftime Report. Business Lunch up next.